Well, good morning, everyone. I know some people will still be uh, coming in a couple minutes late, but uh, good morning to those that are here now. I'm going to start the webinar on legal sports wagering in New Jersey and uh, specifically March Madness and beyond. For those who don't know me, my name is Phil Glick. I am a peer gambling recovery specialist. Uh, the peer part of that title means that I am someone who struggled and still fights the addiction. I haven't placed a bet in four years and 11 months, and I don't plan on placing any, but uh, every day I have to be very careful. And part of what I do here is answer the phones and try to help people who uh, need some support, recovery, hope. And uh, that's what I do here at the council. And today we're going to talk about legal sports wagering in the state of New Jersey, which started in 2018. And for those who don't know, March is Problem Gambling Awareness Month. And uh, no, not sure celebrate is the right word, but we recognize that here at the council. And um, we've put on a couple webinars already this month. Uh, Michael Garcia did one on when to have the talk with the youth and Vin Bickler did one on gambling in the military. And we'll have one coming up in early April, which I'll uh, talk to you uh, at the end of this webinar. But thank you for attending today. So when I first got this assignment, I'll call it, uh, it was right around Super Bowl time. And I was wondering how much money is placed legally on the Super Bowl in New Jersey, how much is bet on the Super Bowl in New Jersey. Uh, the first year in New Jersey uh, showed 34.9 million. And then it went up in 2020 to 54 million, continued to go up in 2021 at just over 117 million. 2022, I was guessing it might be about the same. Other people were guessing it would be slightly up, maybe to about 120. And you may be asking, why not the same sort of increase we saw? from 2020 to 2021. And the main reason I thought for that would be because New York now has legal sports gambling. Uh, but New Jersey surpassed my estimate and did almost 144 million in legal Super Bowl wagers. Did New Jersey make a profit on that? The answer is yes. About 7 million of that was profit for New Jersey, meaning New Jersey sports books made money on the Super Bowl. Uh, that doesn't always happen. If a line, uh, is a point spread is considered incorrect or not balanced, a sports book can lose money on a particular game. Super Bowl made money for New Jersey. We'll look at some more of the New Jersey stats. So here are the legal sports betting totals for New Jersey. In 2018, the total for the year, remember New Jersey started in the middle of 2018 and really a lot of the books only got going for about the last two months. The total was one and a quarter billion dollars. 2019, that went up to close to 4.6 billion. In 2020, it was just over 6 billion. And then in 2021, in the early months of the year, there are some articles, if you go back, will New Jersey ever have a billion dollar month? And for the year, the total for 2021 was just under 11 billion. And the answer to my, will New Jersey ever have a billion dollar month question is yes. 
September, October, November, and December were all over $1 billion in legal sports bets in New Jersey. That trend continued in January of this year with $1.34 billion. Uh, the streak was broken in February. New Jersey came in at just under a billion dollars. Um, and that includes, February included the Super Bowl. So the Super Bowl number was larger than I expected. The February number may have been a bit smaller. Why? There wasn't a lot else going on in February other than the Super Bowl. Some of the NFL playoff matchups were, I guess, not that compelling for betters. But for whatever reasons, February broke that streak and was just under a billion dollars. Still a large number. So does New Jersey make money on sports gambling? Uh, sort of a, a lot of different ways to take that question, but the short answer is yes. But how much? And what percentage? I was reading articles that if a state is doing a good job with setting point spreads and the sports books are doing a good job, the percentage should be somewhere between five and 8% on the take or the hold or the VIG. And I'm throwing a lot of terms out there, some that I understand fully, some that I don't understand fully, but I'll still put them out there. Um, me understanding something doesn't, uh, not understanding something doesn't uh, always prevent me from mentioning it. But let's see how much New Jersey made. Now there are a few different numbers here in these categories. Uh, there's the year, there's the hold percentage that was profit on the bets, which I mentioned uh, a lot of states, a lot of sports books would expect to see that number between five and 8%. And New Jersey's done that with holds of in the 7% range, a little bit lower in 19 and 20 in the sixes and back in the seven and a half percent range in 2021. Uh, the revenue is mentioned there in um, the third column, and then the tax dollars. Now, tax is different than the hold. The tax on gambling in New Jersey uh, opens up a, another can of worms with different rates for uh, tax rates for betting in person versus betting online versus what type of sport you may be uh, betting on, whether it's you know, football, baseball, basketball, or if it's something with different rates such as horse racing. Uh, but the tax rate in New Jersey compared to other states is on the lower side. If you do the math, it works out to uh, approximately 12%. Uh, so there's a lot going on in this chart. Um, and at the end of the, the webinar, I do cite where, where we got all these numbers. We're not pulling these numbers out of uh, thin air. They are uh, numbers that are, are available if you look around the various websites and what New Jersey uh, puts, fo puts forth for public consumption. Not many people probably look into this for the, for the reasons I was looking into it in setting up this webinar. Um, if there are any questions along the way, throw them into the chat. I'll do my best to uh, try to answer them as best I can. As I mentioned, um, my last wager was way back in 2017, so I've done no legal sports betting in New Jersey. Did some sports betting in New Jersey years and years ago uh, in manners I'm not quite as proud of. 
um, but we certainly hope those days are in the past. I intend to keep them there. Uh, so here's a little example of um, how the house makes a profit. Um, and I'll get to that, uh, the couple questions um, I see over on the side, I'll try to uh, get to them if, if possible, for sure. And if I don't get to them during the hour today, I have a recording of this, I'll, I'll track uh, and, and get back to the people who ask the questions for sure. But this is just two typical people who may walk into a sports book and place a bet. <coughs> This is that uh, fierce rivalry between the Wildcats and the Panthers, two teams uh, I made up here. And uh, Jane bets that the Wildcats will defeat the Panthers at odds of minus 110. You may see those type terms if you're trying to just simply watch a game and point spreads start flying on the bottom of the screen and see these plus six and a half points or minus 120 to bet it. I'm trying to show you a little bit of what that means. That 110 indicates how much each of them gave to the sports books in hopes of making a profit of $100. So generally the number they give you is how much, uh, what will happen if you wager this much, um, how much will it take to make a profit of 100? So the Wildcats happen to win the game. And Jane collects $210. How do I get to 210? She gets the 110 she bet that she gave over to the sports book. She gets that back, plus the $100 profit. While Fred has lost his $110 because the Wildcats won and not the Panthers. So, while this transaction may have only been going on for hours or a day or two, at one point the house collected $220 in total and paid out $210 for a profit of $10. And that works out to 10 over 220. So their profit there would be 4.55%. And if you go back to the previous chart where I said, what's the hold percent? And that generally comes out to be somewhere in between five and 8%. There's your hold on this particular wager was 4.55%. The reason most states are, and sports books are able to get it more in the six or 7% range is that different type bets have a higher hold percentage. If you know what a parlay is, that you're putting two or three or four predictions together, the hold there is a lot higher. So that's where this particular play was four and a, about four and a half percent. In total, on average, it's about 7%. So hopefully that cleared that up a little. I'm not positive if it made it more or less confusing, but um, that, that was my research for this. Um, and I'm looking what entity, so I'll try to get to the other question as soon as possible. Uh, when New Jersey started legal sports betting in, 2018, certain sports were approved at that time. So I want you to guess now, and you can put your guesses into the, uh, into the chat box, uh, how many different sports were approved for wagering. And uh, my choices here were as somewhere between one and five, somewhere between six and 10, somewhere between 11 and 15, and somewhere between 16 and 20. I see some, uh, I didn't set this up as a poll. I should have done it that way, but I didn't. Ah, got some 16 to 20, some 
And uh, as you'll realize after you've uh, you've made your guess, I suckered you all because the correct answer is not even one of the choices. The correct answer is 30. Now, could you even name 30 sports? It might take me a while, but uh, here were the approved sports and it leads to something we can talk about which affects New Jersey as, uh, as early as uh, night. But here were the approved sports at the time New Jersey approved them for gambling. Football as we know it, not soccer, but American uh, football. Uh, athletics, I didn't really even know what that was, but uh, Australian rules football, similar to rugby, I think. Uh, badminton, I love, I love me some good badminton action. Um, <laughs> I, I, we'll see if bull riding appears later, I don't know. Uh, basketball, billiards, boxing, bowling, bull riding, cricket, some of my favorite things to wager on, uh, darts, uh, entertainment, which includes things like the Emmys, perhaps even the Oscars, or competitive eating. I like uh, whenever the Emmys and competitive eating can be in the same sentence. That's, uh, that's always good. Uh, golf, hockey, lacrosse, lawn bowling, the UFC. Olympics has an asterisk, I'll explain that in a second. Racing, which as best I could see included some car racing, but also includes horse racing, but that's under a different governing body with different taxes. Now, someone has to, a sports book has to offer these, or you can't do it legally, but the sports book is theoretically allowed to offer. So uh, rugby sailing snooker, uh, which I thought was cool, but I guess it's different. Don't yell at me for that. Soccer has a couple asterisks. That's for certain leagues were approved at the time and certain were not approved. So if you wanted to bet North Macedonia against Italy, I don't know if that was approved or not. Uh, table tennis, tennis, and volleyball. Uh, so some events in the Olympics, which had one of the asterisks, are not allowed uh, because minors were participating. I found that interesting. Like I said, soccer was certain leagues. And then that thrown in last line in small print, uh, New Jersey college teams and New Jersey based events may fall under the prohibited sports event clause. Well, why would that matter tonight? And even earlier in March Madness, the NCAA tournament, there is a New Jersey team still playing in the NCAA men's basketball tournament, St. Peter's. So congratulations to St. Peter's for making the final 16 teams, but you cannot wager on that game legally in New Jersey. Now, earlier on in the week, I was still double checking facts and figures for this webinar, and I saw an article entitled the closest places to drive if you can't bet on your team because they're in state. And that included teams that play out of Pennsylvania, out of New Jersey. So New Jersey is not the only state to have this rule that you can't wager on in-state teams. But I thought it was a little despicable to have the advice on where's the closest place to drive out of state. But that, that's my opinion, not the council's opinion. I just uh, thought it was in poor taste. So watch the St. Peter's game, enjoy it. 
would be my advice. Now, I had March Madness in the title of this webinar because it's such a big deal. Everybody knows that term, March Madness, and there's one winner and um, it's interesting. So why does March Madness work? Why does the concept work? Here are some facts and some theories. Some of the theories are more uh, put forward by me than anybody else, but some of the theories are just uh, editorials I saw online. So teams are involved nationwide. That gets everybody involved. If a specific uh, football game includes two teams from the East Coast, let's say the Giants are playing the Eagles, that may not have nationwide attention. But with 60 eight teams in the NCAA tournament, you're often covered from Hawaii to Maine or Hawaii to Florida or everywhere in between. There are three weekends plus of games. The Super Bowl is the single biggest event, but it's just that one event. And $140 million is a huge number. Um, but it's limited because it's only one game. Um, other than some, different than some other sports that have playoffs, you can do the brackets or fill out a pool for the NCAA tournament right at the start. The way other sports probably fairly reseed after each round meaning the top ranked team will play the lowest ranked team still remaining, it's hard to fill out the playoffs from start to finish. Everybody kind of gets the concept of the brackets and okay, I fill them out from start to finish. I always thought that was something not a lot of people touch on, but it just, it made it an easier thing to wager on my case, more dangerous, but easier. Um, betting on individual games is now legal in 30 states plus DC. Number seems to continue to grow, but that goes back to, to the nationwide aspect of, of this. Um, if you fill out brackets in an office and everybody puts in $10 and the winner keeps it all, that's technically illegal betting. But you know, no, the cops aren't coming by to, to shut that down. If a bookie was doing it for not $10, for hundreds, thousands of dollars, but it makes March Madness, makes the tournament popular. That, hey, I I remember filling out the brackets a couple weeks ago. Is my team still left or are my picks doing well? Or is the person in the mailroom who's never seen a basketball game going to beat me? Okay. Um, team popularity is not based on one or two players. What I mean by that is a lot of times in... NCAA basketball, you're betting the uniform or you're betting the coach. You're picking the school you went to for undergrad or graduate work. Could you name two current players on every school in the tournament? I certainly couldn't. Even when I was in fairly heavy action, Oh, yeah, well, I know this person coaches Duke, so they'll probably win. So I'm betting the team, Duke has a reputation, the coach has a reputation. I'm not necessarily betting the players. Player is there for a year or two leaves, the whole thing doesn't fall apart. So you're kind of betting the team, not just one person. If you know, 
Tom Brady leaves the Patriots, they probably won't be as good. Tom Brady left the Patriots, they weren't as good. If a particular player leaves uh, a Duke in basketball, they were probably still going to be pretty good. And, you know, why is something like the lottery important? You put in a small amount of money, you dream, and someone wins a decent amount of money. So you may have your own theories, but uh, it, it's a popular event, almost more popular than it should be in my mind, but here are some reasons why it's popular. If you have others, feel free to put them in the chat and I'll consider them. <laughs> Not whether I get to decide whether they're right or wrong, but I'll think about it. All right, how much madness is there in New Jersey? And sorry if some of this cut off because of the chat, you could probably move your box around or, or shrink it easier than I can. Um, it's hard to figure out based on the numbers I have for New Jersey. New Jersey provides a number each month for how much was wagered on each sport. But basketball covers both the NBA, the professionals, and the NCAA. So it's hard to get a New Jersey March Madness number. As I mentioned, New Jersey fans cannot legally wager on New Jersey-based college teams. So if Seton Hall made a run in the tournament or Rutgers made a run in the tournament or like this year with St. Peter, may lower the amount some. Uh, basketball is easily the second most popular sport to bet on in the state. Uh, almost every month that it's in action, football is number one. Uh, basketball, number two, well above uh, baseball and hockey. Uh, I think later on, I estimate the March Madness amount at about 200 million in New Jersey. So more than the Super Bowl, but not if there are 67 games, it's not anywhere close to 60 times larger than the Super Bowl in terms of wagering amount. Um, when I go on events, I try to speak at some schools, some VA hospitals, some um, 55 and over communities where uh, the council does a lot of presentations. A question we get is, hi, nice to meet you. Why are there so many darn ads? It's such a pain in the neck. I just want to watch the game. I don't want to see... MGM and FanDuel and, and DraftKings and all that. Um, and I only found this out a day or two ago, but the NCA became the first major sports organization to ban sportsbook commercials during an event, during its biggest event, when it announced that such ads would not be allowed during March Madness. So I went out of my way to watch a little bit of one game last night and I didn't see ads during the game. I'm sure there were ads right before it, right after it. I'm not sure about halftime. There were ads on other channels while the game, the game was on channel two. There were betting ads on channel four, but I look at that as at least someone's listening that, hey, you know, this is starting to annoy the fans. I don't, what could happen from this? Maybe there'll be multiple broadcasts of some big events, some with, some without um, gambling advertising, but that seems like a positive sign to me if they could limit it to a few a game. I, re I remember um, being in communications classes in college, and they would tell me, oh, you'll never see uh, the same product advertised twice in one commercial break, even for different brands. You won't see detergent A and then another ad and then detergent B 
in the same commercial break. Well, with sports books, it wasn't quite back to back, but during some football games, I know there were multiple companies in the span of a few minutes showing ads. So any reduction in that, especially when you're dealing with, hey, I'm watching 18 to 22 year olds play, it doesn't seem right to be betting on them, but I um, won't get into all that. So some predictions going forward, and then I'll try to handle some more uh, questions, but um, what could happen down the line? And, you know, I, I worry about these things in terms of how many other people are going to be fighting uh, an addiction to gambling. And when stadiums start to get sponsored by gambling websites or casinos, the, to me, that's more troubling than the commercials. Um, I don't know if we're quite there yet, but the I don't think we're very far away from the FanDuel Arena or the um, DraftKings Stadium, um, and that's you know, that's a negative to me. Uh, Sixty Minutes, I, I know, did a piece on. Uh, one of the pro teams having a sports book feet away from the actual arena. I think it was in DC. Don't, don't quote me on that one. But there was a foot or two in between because it couldn't be the same building. All right. They weren't breaking the rules, but gosh, that's... <laughs> That's pretty miserable <laughs> that they that they had to make a building, two feet of space, another building with a beautiful sports book. More people seem to be paying attention to the sports book than were to the game that was going on behind them. Yuck. <laughs> That's my editorial on that. Yuck. Um, uniforms at gambling advertising. Uh, are we going to have uh, patches on the sleeves in preseason baseball games with gambling sites? Again, we got to be a little better than that, I, I think. Um, will athletes start betting? Well, there already was a case of that in between the time I started doing some background on this webinar and now a uh, player for the Atlanta Falcons, Ridley, is suspended for the season for making a wager out of state. Was he betting for or against his team? Well, at least the NFL put right away, hey, we found out about this, you're suspended one year. Will that suspension hold up? Will he be the only one? I don't know, but... There are going to be some cheating scandals, fixing scandals. When enough money is involved, there are accusations. Anytime a player now misses a layup or misses a very short field goal or throws a curveball when everyone thinks he should have thrown a fastball, something in your mind is going to be, wow, I wonder wonder if they were cheating. What's the big deal if on a Tuesday night in August, a baseball team that you root for wins by one run instead of three runs and doesn't cover the spread because they bet against themselves? Who's going to know? Well, if somebody does know, I think there's going to be some stories about that. Are we going to go back to old school accusations of uh, kiting checks and money laundering and, and things that sound like they come out of the, uh, the sting or the godfather? I hope not. Uh, I threw this one in there because um, the, the law passed. I don't see a lot of it yet, but 
for NCAA, and we're talking about March Madness, the NIL law. I don't know if it has periods in between or not, but NIL is name, image, and likeness that college players, students own their name, image, and likeness and can do some things with it. I don't know the ins and outs of that law, but you know, I saw one of the St. Peter's kids this week sitting in front of about eight boxes of Buffalo Wild Wings because he signed some sort of deal with Buffalo Wild Wings. Is it the same thing that a Charles Barkley gets for doing commercials or um, Steph Curry gets for doing eating a Subway sandwich? Probably not. It's probably a very small amount of money, but the college students, to some degree, own their name, image, and likeness. So again, I'm trying to predict what stories are going to be talked about down the line, and I think we're going to hear more about this name, image, likeness, uh, those type stories. And it's always good to uh, throw this into our webinars, I think. And if you may have a problem or someone you know may, has a pro may have a problem, a loved one may have a problem, that's why we're here in this office. That's why we're here going around to schools in New Jersey and VFWs in New Jersey, uh, speaking to these groups. Um, a lot of people don't know the warning signs. This is not an all-inclusive list, and it's not you have one of these that means you have a problem. No, but if you see a few of these in a loved one, or you have them yourself, you know, make a phone call here. Talk to somebody about it. See if there's a problem. If you're wagering increasing amounts to have the same sort of reaction to, oh, I used to play $10 every NFL game. Now I'm playing 2000. You know, that may be an issue. Uh, all you can think about is gambling and acquiring more money to gamble more. And you set aside specific betting money. That may be a problem. Trying to cut back or stop without success that may be an issue. You're restless because of the gambling. I know when I was in action, I had all of these. I wanted to escape. I wanted some entertainment. It was all I could think about. If I won, I wanted to win more. If I lost, I would chase those losses. I became an expert liar, expert borrower of money and I know I'm not the only one who uh, risked relationships that really mean a lot to me, family and friends. So if you see any of these warning signs in yourself or a loved one, that's, that's why we have the phone number 800-GAMBLER. You can call it. We will talk to you, deal, it with, deal with the call with care and compassion um, and certainly try to help or get you get you the help you need and the support you need. And what does that mean? The support? Um, get you to an approved treatment provider. Um, we have now 45, I believe, in, in the state. We're uh, training more. Uh, Michael Garcia does an excellent job with that. Uh, if you know someone who's interested to be on our approved treatment provider list, uh, get in contact with Michael, um, but recommend meeting one-on-one -on -one with uh, those, uh, those fine people in this state. Uh, encourage the person calling, even if they're calling on behalf of a family member or a friend, get to a group meeting whether it's Gamblers Anonymous, whether it's in person or online, um, try one. It's not going to hurt. 
Um, New Jersey and a lot of the states that are in that 30 plus uh, states that have legalized sports gambling also have self-exclusion lists. Get yourself on those self-exclusion lists. You shouldn't get flyers in the mail. You close all your accounts. If you try to collect on a winning wager, you won't be able to. If a casino or other brick and mortar organization realizes you're in the building, they'll escort you out of the building. Um, so the self-exclusion list um, that's done through the Department of Gaming Enforcement it's not done through by calling us, but we can get you the information you need um, to talk to the right people about the New Jersey self-exclusion list. There are some software programs. More and more people that uh, call me here and all of us here uh, are worried about their sons or daughters and what they're doing online. So if you think they're gambling online or, or with their phone, there are software programs and apps that can be installed to help to block those, those uh, sites and, and what's happening on those devices. It's not foolproof. None of these things are foolproof, but uh, talking about it um, helps a lot and stopping it as soon as possible helps a lot. Uh, somebody calls here, one of the first questions I tend to ask is, who else knows? A lot of times we're the first call. All right, try, I'll tell them, you know, in the next three to five days, try to tell some sort of loved one. Try to tell a spouse, a parent, a kid, hey, I got this problem. Um, don't go through it by yourself. When there's help out there, going through it by yourself, that doesn't make you stronger, that makes you, <laughs> I don't, don't wanna get mean with the words here, but try, trying to do it yourself isn't necessary. And there are, and there are a lot of these linked on 800gambler.org. There are a lot of good podcasts, good videos. I mentioned the webinars we've done over the past few months. Take a few hours out of your day, out of your weekend, listen to a, a podcast, watch a video or two. You'll be amazed, at least I was amazed, listening to other people tell their stories. And I thought my story was, I got to be the only person who thinks like this. And I go to a GA meeting or I listen to these uh, people on the video. I'm like, they're just like me. They're slightly broken like me. Let's get it fixed. And so have those, know those resources. And somebody just mentioned Gamban. Yeah, it's good, good software. Um, I didn't quite catch the, the question on the stock market, but yeah, stock market, cryptocurrency. My answer on those things is if you're watching it every hour, every day, checking up on it, uh, then it becomes more like gambling than investing. If you're buying 50 shares of a blue chip stock and putting it away and not thinking about it for a year, that's, to me, that's an investment. If you're day trading, you know, twice an hour, 10 hours a day, to me, that's game. And that's, who am I to say? There, there are a lot smarter people, uh, even on this webinar right now, uh, with a lot uh, fancier initials after their names, who, who could define that better for you. But uh, if you're asking me, if it's, if it's showing signs of gambling, it, it just may be. Just may be. And that's something we've covered in some of our previous um, webinars. So uh, look into those uh, as well. Uh, the fine people here at 800 Gambler, I wanted to give them a shout out because they all deserve it. And uh, uh, given the amounts, <laughs> this is my soapbox, uh, given the amounts of 
handle and gambling that the state has, this 800 gambler staff should probably have a lot more people. But the, this isn't page one of 10, this is, this is the staff. And uh, they all work their butts off. And uh, like I said, I've only been here since August, but uh, they are some great people listed there. If you need help with anything, please uh, get in touch with us. Uh, the website is there, 800gambler.org. Um, and you can call the 800 Gambler number or the 609 588 5515. And I also mentioned, oh, where'd it go? My very last page. There we go. I hope I got that back. Uh, if I didn't, I apologize. Our next webinar is Friday, April the 8th at 11 o'clock. Luis will be doing that. And uh, uh, that will be exploring the link between gambling and homelessness. If there are any other questions, uh, you could let me know or uh, let us know here at the council and we will try to answer them. But I wish everyone a very good weekend and not saying you can't uh, enjoy some basketball this weekend. You can, but just uh, and just be careful <laughs> with how much of it you watch and uh, how much of those brackets you do. And saying let's go St. Pete's is, is just fine by me. And I hope everyone has a great uh, uh, rest of the day and a good weekend. And thanks so much for the nice comments. And thanks for much, so much for listening today.